you can, you can tell how excited I am. We are to be in Seattle. Seattle. I wanted to get up here right away. Edward, you now have a lifetime subscription to the nation. Um, thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, the nation loves Seattle. We love Seattle because we know that this city has long believed that another world is possible. Uh, the battle for Seattle in 1999 was a defining moment for the nation. Uh, my colleague John Nichols uh, was here along with a team of nation correspondents. Naomi Klein's No Logo framed that extraordinary moment. And I think you can see the arc, the continuum, as you look out across the world today, thousands of people in the streets, in countries fighting austerity politics, discredited status quo politics, and we see it in our own country coming back in Seattle was central to that. Um, it is extraordinary to be with some of the people uh, from this city you're going to hear from tonight, Shama Sawant, uh, Pramila Jayapal, Nick Lakata. They give us inspiration in New York, and they give inspiration to progressives, to humanists around this country. You are in for a treat, a celebration, an evening of inspiration and celebration. And I now want to bring up here to who will help guide us tonight, will MC, is a truly extraordinary, critical part of the nation, uh, national affairs correspondent John Nichols. Uh, if you don't know him, you're going to meet him. You're not going to want to say goodbye to him. He is a contributor, longtime contributor of the nation to many other publications. He's the architect of the media and democracy movement. And let me just uh, quote, uh, from former Nation contributing editor, uh, the great late Gore Vidal, what he said about John. Of all the giant slayers now afoot in the great American desert, John Nichols' sword is the sharpest. Before I turn it over to the great slayer, John Nichols, let me just say that all of the speakers and performers here tonight would like to gratefully acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional territorial of the Coast Salish peoples. And with that, John Nichols. <laughs> Katrina Vandenhoevel. Seattle is an incredibly cool town. And what I like about the people of Seattle is that they're well aware of that. <laughs> so when you say it's a cool town, everybody's like, yeah. <laughs> That's good because you, you aspire there. And I, I, I just want to begin by saying that, that your coolness kind of put us off a little. I'm sorry, you know, many of us come from rural places and... and we weren't sure we were ready. And that's why we waited 150 years to bring this event to Seattle, Washington. Because we feel we are ready to stand with you. And I saw it today. I'm up there on Pike Street and 10th. I'm walking around, I saw the Comet Tavern. And I thought to myself, this is it. Finally, the Nation magazine in alcoholic form. <laughs> not kidding. No. I mean, some of, my, some of my comrades for the Nation have not been there yet. But on the front of the Comet Tavern in huge, very nicely printed lettering, it says, no sexism, racism, ableism, homophobia, transphobia, or general hatefulness allowed. We won. No, I'm serious. I come from Wisconsin. When the bars say that, that is very good. And then, framing it was the clenched fist of solidarity of the trade union movement and social democracy. And I was reminded that Seattle is a union town. Seattle is a union town. I was here in 1999, and I remember the incredible excitement when we were down in 
I think it was at one of your stadiums, built by one of your billionaires. If you built it, the billionaire just got the tax break or whatever. Yeah, I know. It's like, it's a, the town is sick with billionaires. But so anyways, I'm down there and, and I think it was Trumpka got up and he said, no, I'm sorry. It was the head of the Longshore Union. The head of the Longshore Union got up and said, we have just shut the ports from Vancouver to San Diego. And I thought to myself, this is so cool. Trade unionism actually making something happen, or in this case, not happen. And the thing we made not happen in 1999 in Seattle was an overwhelming wave of globalization on behalf of multinational corporations that sought to take away everything that we cared about. And people in this town stood up so strong, so well. It didn't stop them all, it didn't stop everything, but it sent a message out from this town, from Seattle, that they would not pass without a fight. And brothers and sisters, we've been fighting them now for 15 years, 16 years. And each step of the way, we have gotten stronger. The trade union movement has changed. We cover it at The Nation magazine more now than we have for decades because there's something vital and something real happening. The Nation is 150 years old, but we keep getting reminded of what actually matters on the streets in places across this country and around the world. We have to be in touch with it because The Nation magazine doesn't know how to make money. We got to be with the people. Now I'm serious. This is this is a competence issue, and I understand. But this is really true. The, I got in trouble the other night because I said that in the entire 150 years, the Nation magazine had only made a profit in one quarter. <laughs> Not one quarter of 150 years. One quarter of one year. And I was corrected. Katrina Vanderhul immediately ran to me and said, "said No, 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 no. You've got it way wrong." It was several quarters. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is the nation has never, ever been some big profitable journal. The nation magazine has always wasted its money, wasted its resources, going out finding Canadians like Naomi Klein, <laughs> giving them work in America. Naomi Klein is with us tonight. Is that is very cool, isn't it? <laughs> Doing crazy things like hiring a sports writer, trying to say that there's something political about sports. Dave Zirin is with us tonight. <laughs> Doing all these incredible things but also covering the grassroots politics of communities across this country. And to do that, you know, you don't make a big fortune. It's not big money in it. Sometimes you're a little bit ahead of the curve, writing about something that people have to catch up with. Sometimes you have to read another magazine. You got to say, well, who's a little ahead of us? So we always pick up our copy of Yes! Magazine <laughs> from right here in Seattle. We got the folks from Yes! Magazine right here all together. And we got our comrades all over. And we love us some Seattle Education Association teachers. Our friend Jesse Hagopian is here tonight. Jesse was just out on strike with the teachers. But it was such a nation strike. Because when Jesse and those teachers went out on strike, they didn't just go out on strike for their own pay or their own benefits. They went on strike to challenge this over-the-top crazy testing. They went on strike 
to challenge overcrowded classrooms. They went on strike to challenge the neglect of children by a system that, may, that always has money for a war, but never has money for public education. Brothers and sisters, I think they took a little bit of that Occupy message and brought it into the public education fight. And, you know, in New York City, when the Occupy movement broke out, one of our editors at The Nation magazine, you know, editors are supposed to sit at their computer and not look up. They wear those little green visors. One of our editors at The Nation magazine, he just couldn't resist. He had to go out there and cover the hell out of it because we don't have editors that just sit there. We have editors that get into the thick of it because they love the story and they love the struggle. Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored tonight to introduce to you as the first of a number of speakers who will do both readings from classic nation articles but also some comments of their own. I'm honored to introduce you to you the person who edits our web pages and has brought the nation into the 21st century in so many ways but has never, ever forgotten the 150-year core mission of this journal of peace and economic and social justice. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Richard Kim. Thank you, John. Thank you, Seattle. I'm going to be reading from an essay written by the great American writer, Tony Kushner. It's called Socialism of the Skin, and it was first published in The Nation on July 4th, 1994. And I read this essay as a college student for the first time, and it was probably the reason I applied for an internship at The Nation magazine. Um, and many years later, I dug up that internship folder, um, and I saw the sort of notes on it, and it had said, wait list. Um, <laughs> so I guess some people turned down that internship, and that's, that's how I ended up at The Nation um, all these years. <laughs> um, but. Seriously, I, I make an effort to go back and read this Tony Kushner essay um, every few years because it poses a set of questions to me that I, I have not done answering. Um, it, it's, a, it's a very challenging text, um, and I think it's a really rich one to this day. Is there a relationship between homosexual liberation and socialism? That is an unfashionably utopian question but I oppose it because it's entirely conceivable that we will one day live miserably in a thoroughly ravaged world in which lesbians and gay men can marry and serve openly in the military, and that's it. Capitalism, after all, can absorb a lot. Poverty, war, alienation, environmental destruction, colonialism, unequal development, boom-bust cycles, private property, individualism, commodity fetishism, the fetishization of the body, the fetishization of violence, guns, drugs, child abuse, underfunded and bad education, itself a form of child abuse, these things are key to the successful functioning of the free market. Homophobia is not. The system could certainly accommodate demands for equal rights for homosexuals without danger to itself. But are officially sanctioned homosexual marriages and identifiably homosexual soldiers the ultimate aims of homosexual liberation? Clearly not. If by homosexual liberation we mean the liberation of homosexuals who, like most everyone else, are and will continue to be oppressed by the depredations of capital until some better way of living together can be arrived at. So then, are homosexual marriages and soldiery the ultimate, which is to say the only achievable aims of the gay rights movement? A politics not of vision, but of pragmatics. Such a politics of homosexuality is dispiriting. Like conservative thought in general, it offers very little in the way of hope and very little in the way of vision. What of all the other things gay men and lesbians have to fear? What are the things gay children have to fear in common with all children? 
What of the planetary despoilment that kills us, or the financial necessity that drives some of us into unsafe, insecure, stupid, demeaning, and ill-paying jobs? Or the unemployment that impoverishes some of us, or the racism some of us face, or the rape some of us fear? What about AIDS? Is it enough to say not our problem? Of course, gay and lesbian politics is a progressive politics. It depends on progress for the accomplishment of any of its goals. Is there any progressive politics that recognizes no connectedness, no border crossings, no solidarity, or possibility for mutual aid? Perhaps the far horizon of lesbian and gay politics is a socialism of the skin. Our task is to confront the political problematics of desire and repression. Stonewall was a 60s thing, part of the utopian project of that time. Honoring the true desire of the skin and the connection between the skin and the heart and the mind and the soul is what homosexual liberation is about. Gay rights may be attainable on however broad or limited a basis, but liberation depends on a politics that goes beyond, not an anti-politics. Our happiness as scared queer children doesn't only isolate us; it also politicizes us. It inculcates in us a desire for connection that is all the stronger because we have experienced its absence. Our suffering teaches us solidarity, or it should. When this essay was published in 1994, same-sex marriage was illegal, not just in every state in the country, but in every country in the world. 25 states in America made gay sex punishable as a felony crime. So 21 years later, on June 26. The Supreme Court issues a 5-4 ruling in Obergefell v. Hodges, legalizing same-sex marriage nationwide, making <laughs> making the United States the 23rd nation in the world to do so.、Um, so, what are we to make of Tony's essay today? What are we to make of it? Here's one way of looking at it. On that day, June 26, 2015. Four people, including two women and a toddler, were found dead in a home in Green Acres, Florida. It was the 164th mass shooting in the United States this year. On that same day, President Obama delivered the eulogy for Reverend Clemente Pinckney, who was shot and killed along with eight other people in his church in Charleston, South Carolina, earlier that month. Since June 26, there have been 136 more mass shootings, bringing the total to 300 this year so far, to 1,000 mass shootings in America. Since the Sandy Hook massacre that killed 20 children between the ages of six and seven, on June 26, police shot and killed 28-year-old Joe Cisneros in San Antonio, Texas. He was among the 896 people this year who have been shot and killed by police in the United States. More than half of those shot and killed have been people of color, and almost 25% of them have been African American men. On June 26, six months after the president declared the end of combat operations. A U.S. drone strike killed six alleged militants in Nuristan Province. It was among the at least 78 drone strikes in Afghanistan this year so far, where we learned today that the U.S. intends to keep thousands of troops through to the end of 2017. If June 26 was like any other day, then over 100 million Americans ended that day below or near the poverty line. 30 million Americans were out of work or underemployed. One in nine people around the world went to bed hungry that night. So yes, one way to look at it is that Tony was right. The day the Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage was a day filled with as much violence and fear and want as any other day. But I don't actually think that's the point of socialism of the skin. And I had to read the essay many, many times to arrive at a different way of reading of it. Tony wasn't trying to paint an unchanging dystopian landscape, and then take comfort in the idea that he would, in some ways, always be right. Aha! Things are always miserable. He was doing the opposite. He was urging us towards what he called the unfashionably utopian, and I can't stand here today and say that we are anywhere near that utopia, socialist or otherwise. And I don't know if I will ever be to say, ever be able to say that. But here are a few things I do know. I know that as Tony was writing these words in 1994, a group of inconceivably brave and staggeringly young men and women were literally fighting for their lives. They called themselves ACT UP. And they use their bodies and their words and their art to disrupt the callousness and cruelty of business as usual. They storm the NIH. They storm the CDC. They storm St. Patrick's Cathedral. They scatter the ashes of their loved ones on the White House lawn because that is where the blame ought to rest. They refuse to be disposed of. They were beautiful. 
They taught themselves science and medicine and law and how to navigate the maze of arcane federal bureaucracies. And I know that because of those people, the development of drugs that saved millions and millions of people's of lives around the world was accelerated. And I know that some of those people, some of those who are still alive, are still fighting. Because there are still millions of people in sub-Saharan Africa and other poor countries that need access to these life-saving drugs to survive. And they are also fighting to stop the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement because they would bestow... <laughs> because it would bestow on giant pharmaceutical companies patents that would kill millions more around the world from diseases that are, like AIDS, entirely preventable and entirely treatable. I know that two days before the Supreme Court ruling in Obergefell, in what was supposed to be a closed-door photo op of LGBT leaders in the White House, another brave young woman named Genesette Gutierrez heckled President Obama. She was an undocumented, she's an undocumented trans woman, and she was raising the plight of other LGBT undocumented immigrants in ICE detention centers. And for doing this, she was shouted down by her fellow advocates and escorted out of the Oval Office. But later, her protest went public, and when it went public, it went viral. I know that so many of the leaders of the immigrant rights movement are queer, and they are coming out again. Not as lesbian or gay or trans, but as undocumented. In an attempt to weaponize their own personal stories in the mold of the gay rights movement, to assert that immigrants, too, have the right to form a family. I know that the success of the LGBT movement wouldn't have been possible if it weren't for women's liberation, if it weren't for the anti-war movement, if it weren't for the civil rights movement. And I know that just because we have marriage equality doesn't mean we are done fighting. As we tell the story of how gay marriage was won in so many books and movies and TV specials, I believe it is even more important that we keep telling the stories that aren't done yet the stories that don't fit just inside one movement. I know that none of us are as alone as we think we are. None of our communities are estranged from each other as they seem to be. And I know that if your politics only makes you comfortable with your own misery, then you are doing your politics all wrong. So here's to solidarity. Here's to mutual aid and to border crossings. Here's to unexpected and unlikely connections. Here's to utopia in all its unfashionableness. And here's to being brave enough and young at heart enough to listen to those utopian longings. Enjoy the rest of this wonderful evening. Thank you.